hand over to Fraser. Thanks, Alicia. Um, so I'm Fraser Batty from the Strast Unit. I've got my background in terms of the topic. I've got about 20 years of experience as a, a program evaluator and then more latterly as an advisor and uh, supporter within, uh, within the health care sector. Um, and so I'm distilling the work that I've done with logic models uh, down into a sort of hours session. It's, it's pitched very much as an introduction, but I'll, I'll push in some territory, particularly towards uh, the end, which is a little bit more uh, advanced in terms of the material. Um, I just wanted to say something about the, the programme more broadly. As Alicia said, if you're not part of the population health management programme in the Midlands, you're very welcome to stay. The, the material, in a sense, is, is hopefully good generic. Uh, stuff that you'll get some value from. Um, but the idea for this session did very much come through the uh, Population Health Management Support Programme for the Midlands, which is funded by NHS e and i uh, with, with Public Health England and others working uh, very closely uh, with them. And there's, there's sort of two main components to the Academy, really. One is to support a set of multidisciplinary teams from STPs in the Midlands through the design and uh, the delivery then of a population health management project and that's that's one strand of the work and the other strand is the analyst academy where we're supporting uh, analysts in terms of their technical skills and abilities to support population health management in the region and we've used logic models in both of those strands we've used logic models with the stp core teams and with the analysts and in both cases we've we've had demand for sort of follow-up material and follow-up sessions and so that's why we're uh, doing this doing this webinar and um, the session the session we've put together is um is in is in five parts first of all i'll just talk you through a uh, a basic logic model so you'll you'll meet the basic structure um fairly shortly secondly i'll outline uh, the case as i see it for the use of logic models i'll do that through uh three example uses. Thirdly, I'll, I'll move on, I'll elaborate the basic logic model and talk a bit more uh, in detail about the different components of a logic model and I'll, I'll talk you through a template that we quite often use. Fourthly, I'll then move into some of the practicalities for assembling uh, logic models and, and talk you through some of, the, some of the tips that I've picked up over the years about how you'll actually put one uh, together. And then fifthly, and probably the more I don't know, perhaps the more advanced bit of the session, we'll start to talk a little bit about what complexity thinking or systems thinking might mean for uh, logic models. So we've got five sections, but, but, but really I'm only going to wait, make one fundamental point. So you're very welcome to turn off at, <laughs> at this moment if this, if this just registers with you. I mean, it seems to me that we, we underuse upfront thinking in health and social care sectors we too often leap to solutions we too often often leap to things which at least on the face of it seem like the right thing to do or are attractive for a set of reasons without really uh, kicking the tires hard enough and i think logic models are a very very useful tool and you'll see why uh, hopefully shortly um to to try to prevent some uh prevent some mistakes at the design stage of, of initiatives and to really uh, do that thinking up front in theory before you get going uh, in practice. So that's what the session is going to cover. Before we get going, I mean, the, the webinar is notorious for, for low and poor interaction. So we've put together a few poll, quick polling questions to try to stimulate uh, some interaction alongside the, uh, the chat box that Alicia mentioned. So I want to, I want to just do a few quick polling questions. Um, I don't know if right. I want to do a few quick polling questions. So I've got, uh, I've got a few questions for you. The first one is about your relationship in terms of uh, services. So you should see hopefully in front of you uh, a question here, whether you are someone who predominantly designs services and initiatives, whether you're predominantly someone who manages them, who delivers them, or who analyzes them. So I'll just give you, uh, I'll just give you uh, a minute or so to respond to that. It's looking so far, we keep, keep the voting coming, but it's looking so far like we've got the um, analytical community uh, on the webinar. 
predominantly. Just give you a couple more seconds if other people want to vote. Great, thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the, uh, the next question. I wanted to get a sense as to how frequently you uh, use logic models in your work. So there's a, a quick scale there. So how frequently do you use logic models in the work that you do? Just give you another couple of seconds. Yeah, that's really helpful. So it seems in the main as though uh, either never, very rarely, rarely or very um, occasionally do we have uh, people who use logic models in the work. That's really helpful for me to sort of get a sense uh, as we go through in terms of, of where to pitch this. Um, the next question I've got is about how confident uh, you are in your, in your knowledge to set about using a logic model. So building on the last question really. Are you confident enough in your knowledge to set about producing a, a logic model? So yes, straight away, yes, but you need to get the books out. Um, you're not really sure, or uh, no, and definitely not. So I'll just give you a moment to respond to that. That's excellent. So what I'm hoping by the end of this session, perhaps, is that the, the not sures are, are on to yes after some revision and that the people who feel that they need some revision feel like they've got some of it uh, from, from this webinar, perhaps. So, um, OK, I'll come back and we'll do some uh, we'll do some uh, more polling as we progress through the session. But I just wanted to get a, a sense as to who was on the, the webinar. Thank you very much for that. Um, the other thing to say now before I start pushing into the content is just to underscore what Alicia said, please put questions in the chat box and then we'll pause at the end of each section uh, and, and just pick up the, the points that you make there. Okay, so the first um, machine to work. The first uh, section really is just to share uh, a very basic logic model with you, just so you get uh, a bit of a sense as to the, the starting point for this work really. Um, so so here, here comes the sort of basic basic structure. All logic models will have um, a mention of inputs. So these are just the resources consumed and resources. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about it later on in the session. Typically cash, typically time, staffing, uh, that kind of thing. But in a sense, the, the, the starting point for the logic model as it reads from left to right is the, the resources going in. Secondly, then the activities, the things that you use those resources to do, and this is where we come across outputs. So an output would be a quantitative measure of an activity. And again, as we push on through the session, I'll give you more examples. The next component would be outcomes. Um, quite often there's a, a confusion between outputs and outcomes. Well, if an output is a quantitative measure of activity, an outcome is a change resulting from an activity, an effect of an activity. Uh, and again, I'll talk to you uh, more and give you some examples uh, as we progress. And then finally, um, so we've had inputs, we've had resources, we've done some things through our activities, we've achieved some effects or some results through those outcomes. And that would build down the line to impacts or broader societal goods, so much broader down the line impacts that you would expect uh, to follow from your outcomes. Again, I'll, I'll define all of these in, in uh, further as we go through the session. I suppose the only other thing I wanted to say at this point was that you will very often find the terminology varying and, and different people setting up models in different ways will sometimes uh, use different terms when they come to it. But the basic concepts will remain largely constant. So quite often we'll change the label but not change the underlying concept. So that's the, the very, very basic structure. I then want to just give you a couple of uh, examples, a couple of everyday examples that apply that uh, simple structure. The, the first one is, and this is coming from someone who's having uh, their kitchen refurbished at the moment, uh, a simple logic model for refurbishing a house. So you'll see in terms of inputs, we have uh, cash, of course, and time, um, the activities, since I've uh, literally no idea what I'm doing uh, in DIY terms is to source someone who knows what they are, knows what they're doing and, and to manage their work. 
the immediate outcome resulting from that would hopefully be an improved domestic environment, a better kitchen, um, and then down the line impacts, some, perhaps some gain in house value and perhaps some uh, improvement in, in the neighbourhood as well. That's the first example. The second is uh, going on a family holiday, uh, again, perhaps close to my heart, maybe too close. Inputs, uh, you know, cash and time activities, uh, finding somewhere to stay and finding some things to do together as a family. The outcomes, in this case, you know, reductions in stress, but perhaps, and increases in happiness. And then the down the line impact, some improvement in family functioning. So hopefully with those, with those very everyday examples, I've illustrated some of the the application of the basic uh, logic model concept. Hopefully you get some sense of the flow of logic, of the relationship between these different uh, components in, uh, in the model. But I did, just, I did just want to introduce them in a, in a sort of everyday sense before we, before we got going into, um, into deeper territory. What I want to do is pause just ahead of making the case for the use of logic models and just ask Alicia whether there's anything in the chat box that we could usefully pick up now. So we've not got anything at the minute. So if anyone's got any burning questions, now's the time. <laughs> Based on what Fraser just talked about. Okay, so what, what I'll do is I'll keep pushing on um, and I'll just encourage you to pop uh, further questions into the, into the chat boxes uh, as we go through. Okay, so I'm going to outline, having introduced the basic uh, concept of the logic model, I'm now going to outline the case for using them. I've thought of three examples, but what I would like to do is ask you now uh, whether you can think of any, <laughs> any other examples as I go through and perhaps pop, pop them in the chat box uh, as you do, and you might then improve subsequent uh, webinars, subsequent sessions. So there, there are three example uses as I see it. The first is in designing initiatives, and I mentioned this very briefly at the outset, but I think the use of the logic model can be incredibly powerful in aiding the design of different schemes, initiatives, services, policies, whatever it might be. Just really by asking some quite simple questions. First of all, what's your theory of change? So how and why do you think that the activities you're planning will achieve the results that you desire? So it's an incredibly simple starting point, an incredibly simple set of questions, and yet that's so powerful at the start of initiatives. I'm sure we could all imagine uh, programs, services, policies that we've seen that we thought actually would be improved just by asking those questions uh, up front because it would sharpen thinking uh, in design terms. Going a, a bit more uh, into the detail then, my sense is that uh, designing any initiative requires some answers to, to what can be uh, reasonably tough questions. First, first of all, and probably most importantly, is to develop an understanding of the nature and scale of the problem or the problems that the initiative is setting out to address. Um, without that, I, I think it's very difficult to proceed into proper uh, design work. So first of all, what's the nature and scale of the problem? Secondly, what's the difference we're ultimately trying to make? Having understood the problem, what, what difference, what are we trying to correct? What are we really trying to improve uh, in relation to that problem? Thirdly, given that ultimate difference we're trying to make, what are the specific outcomes that we need to achieve on the way? And what activities, therefore, do we think will achieve these outcomes? And how and why do we think those activities will do it? So you see, it's only at this point we're really starting to think about what it is you would do. All the preceding questions are about the nature of the problem and what you would want to achieve ultimately. And then you come to think about what it is you might do. Fifthly then, once you've decided what to do, what resources do you need uh, to do them? And then of course you're, you're into the, the practicalities of, of how to implement and how, how to do it. But I think those design questions are incredibly powerful and every initiative ought to have an answer to, uh, an answer to them. The only other thing I wanted to say at this point is that the, you know, the world is full of pet projects, isn't it? And it's often very difficult to head off the pet project because quite often the person promoting it is you know, in a position of power or has some influence or whatever it might be. And it's very difficult to puncture pet projects uh, head on. But doing them as, asking those difficult questions as part of the task of producing a logic model makes that a much more neutral undertaking. And it seems to me is a great way that analysts in particular can bring some of their thinking to bear in improving uh, things at the design stage.
Okay, I've got a little related question I wanted to just ask through um, the polling, which is just to get a bit of a sense as to your feel for that material and how important you think uh, logic models are to designing initiatives, um, I suppose in principle rather than in your experience. So if you could just respond to uh, that question, I'll, I'll leave it up momentarily. That's really good. I'll end it there. We've got some, um, there's just one skeptic who thinks they're not important at all. Every, everyone else thinks they're either essential or very important or, or of average importance. Um, so thank you very much for uh, your responses to that. I just wanted to get, again, get a sense as to how, how important you felt they, um, that logic models might be. I just wanted to end with, I mean, I've probably worn this slide out, uh, but, but the, um, my sense is that too many initiatives do look a little bit like the cartoon on the slide where you, you quite often see a good precise definition of the problem, some reasonable definition of, as to where you want to get to, and then some missing intervening step where the theory of change really does belong. And that, that to me is where the, the logic model really comes into its design. So that was use one, I think, for the, for the logic model designing initiatives. Use two is perhaps the most um, common or perhaps the most uh, obvious when we think about them, which is in which is an evaluation. What it says here is that every action, every service, every initiative, every policy, whatever it might be, has got some causal theory uh, that underpins it. And that these causal theories tend to go, you know, if we do X, then, then we'll get Y. So if, if we, you know, if we do this service, if we put this thing in place, then we, will sh we should achieve the following uh, outcomes. So I think every action has a causal theory. It's just that I don't think it's always explicit or very, or very often, in fact, it's not explicit um, and that these theories are held implicitly. So it then seems to me that the part of the value of the logic model in terms of evaluation is making the theory explicit before going on to test it. And I've just got a little example that we've put together um, in just showing the sort of logic, showing the theory of change, showing the underpinning theory to a, a training program delivered in uh, care homes. I'll, I'll read it briefly. It's, it says, if, the theory says, if we deliver our training, then we should improve the skills of care home staff. And if the staff are more skilled, then they should be more able to cope in the event of a crisis. And that if they're more able to cope in the event of a crisis, then there should be fewer unplanned admissions. And if there were fewer unplanned admissions, then you would see more people dying in a setting of their own choice. We could give them a better death and we would also be making better use of the resources available to us. And you see just sketching it out in those if then type terms, which again, I think is all too rare in the services and the policies we encounter. If you set it out in those terms, you're, you're displaying the theory, you're making the theory explicit that connects the activities you do through the outcomes you want to achieve uh, into the impacts, those down the line uh, effects that you, you want to build towards. So, so I think the first task in evaluation and the use of the logic model is making these often implicit theories explicit. If you set out the theory, what you then get is a means of defining measures that you could then use for your evaluation. And here's a quick uh, table and I'll signpost you to some further resources at the end of the webinar, which helps you to do that. So it builds, it builds off the activities. If we do this, then we'd expect to see, and then you'll start to list your outcomes out from the model and that we would know if we're achieving the outcomes by looking at the following measures. And then you're, you're getting into the detail of methods you might use, sources and, and time. The only other thing I wanted to say in terms of logic models and evaluation is that my sense is we learn via advances in theory, via advances in, in understanding based on testing the theories that we have within the services or the projects that we provide. So then it seems to me that the unit of analysis for evaluation ought to be the theory. So not the project or the scheme, but evaluation's job should be to tease the theory out and to test the theory. The results of evaluation then are all about refining the theory, what well, it seems to work under these circumstances, but not those. Maybe it's rejecting the theory. I mean, we've quite a lot of the work around risk stratification and case finding and case management. At the moment, it seems to me that evaluation would probably reject that as a sensible theory for uh, reducing unplanned admissions. 
and may, maybe maybe the evaluation provisionally supports the theory, um, but that would always be provisional. The sense that the idea then is that the theory is the thing that gets recycled. The theory is the thing that then gets used in the next round of uh, project or service design. And here's a, a tiny and often used quote um, from Kurt Lewin. There's nothing so practical as a good theory. There's a way in which talking about a theory and evaluation sounds sort of slightly highfalutin or ivory tower. And yet it isn't because that's the thing that we're using whenever we design a service or a project. So nothing so practical as a, as a good theory. So that's use two, evaluation. Use three is in framing economic analysis. I won't make uh, much of this point, but you see the basic logic model set out there, inputs, activities, outcomes, and impacts. When you've produced your logic model for your project, what you've done in defining inputs is defining the costs, and you can then have a, a test of economy. When you've defined the inputs and the activities, you can have some measure of uh, cost efficiency or the pounds uh, per output or the resource use per output, perhaps the person getting the service. And then at a more advanced level, by the time you've defined your inputs and your outcomes, you can start to frame uh, a cost benefit or cost effectiveness analysis. We'd be looking at pounds per outcome or pounds per uh, benefit achieved. So there are three uses that I've uh, uh, thought of. I'm going to pause momentarily to consult <laughs> the chat box and just see whether there are any questions or wh whether people have suggested any further uses. Yep, so we've got one question from Debbie. Um, so this is about how does this work um, where cause or attribution is less obvious? Um, so it's thinking about in early intervention activities, um, which we hope might result in reduced demand on services, but more um, difficult to explicitly demonstrate. That's fantastic. Can I come back to that in about four slides time? I promise, <laughs> I promise, I promise I will. And I have, I have some answer to it in relation to outcomes and how you might think about dividing outcomes out. And then right at the end of the session, I'll talk about it in relation to complexity thinking where that, that problem becomes vastly uh, more difficult actually. Yeah. That's okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll pick that up in just a moment. Right. Okay. What I want to do now is, is we've, we've seen the basic logic model, I've made the case for uh, logic models in general. What I want to do now is elaborate the basic version that I showed you and talk a bit more about the different elements and define them a little bit more. Um, and that's when I'll come back to uh, Debbie's question when we, when we talk about outcomes in particular. So here's, a, here's an elaborated uh, logic model template. You see it's got the basic input activity outcome impact structure as the, the one I showed you earlier, but we've added two elements in. The first is rationale, which is the problem or opportunity to be addressed. And then the second element is context, which fits around the whole uh, logic model. And I'll, again, I'll, I'll talk about each one of these things uh, in turn. And I'll try to do this in the order that I would recommend you construct your logic model. So I'll try to give you some sense as to the practicalities of assembling them uh, as I do this. So the first place to start, it seems to me, uh, I said earlier, is, is, is with problems. You need to start generating an understanding as to why you should do something rather than doing uh, nothing. And the components of the logic model that would help you to think about this is, is the rationale. So in, in summary, the rationale is the, the sort of case for acting in the first place. It's normally when we think about public policy and uh, public services, normally expressed in terms of problems, but also it could be expressed in terms of uh, opportunities to be seized. The basic question you're facing is what's the nature and scale of these, uh, of these problems or perhaps these opportunities? So who suffers from this and in, and in what sorts of ways? And also what would you expect to happen if you do nothing? So why would current responses be uh, inadequate? In a sense, you're building the case for the thing that you will then do to, in terms of your intervention. Um, I just want to signpost you briefly to a set of tools that we've produced and are sharing openly on uh, the Strategy Unit website on the Innovation and Evaluation microsite, which I'll signpost you to later. We, there's a set of really good tools in there for, for really digging into problems and looking at the drivers and the causes of them. Uh, but I'll, I'll return to that later. So that's the rationale. Then you should be working back. So starting with impacts, what change, given your understanding of the problem, what change do you ultimately want to see? I said I'd define our impacts a little bit more. So uh, here we are. Impacts I would understand as being the final effects, the final headline uh, impact that you're looking to work towards. 
often expressed at a, a really quite high level. So, for, for example, increases in life expectancy, healthy life expectancy, uh, reductions in health inequality or more financially or clinically sustainable services, for example. So broader societal goods. In the, in the end of life care example I gave earlier, that was people getting a death of their choice and, and about better resource use. So that, that kind of thing. They very often relate closely to the rationale. And as I said, they're expressed at a high level. I find the triple or quadruple or quintuple or whatever we've got to now um, aim to be a really useful framework for thinking about these things, because quite often you're aiming at things that are about better health outcomes, reductions in inequality, better resource use, better experience for staff and patients. So that's quite often a useful, a useful framework to use. Starting to get into Debbie's question, the changes at the level of the impact, you would only really be claiming that are indirectly attributable to your intervention. So you'd be saying that you're contributing towards those things rather than necessarily making some sort of causal claim because the contextual factors around your intervention will have um, a really significant influence over impacts. If we thought back to the example of training in care homes, it seems to me it would be Stretching, stretching the claim a little to say that they would be straightforwardly causing uh, people to have a, a death in a setting of their choice. And yet it seems to me you could fairly straightforwardly claim that they're contributing towards it in, in some way. So that would be impacts. Then keep working back. So getting, getting more detailed about it, what outcomes do you need to achieve to uh, see your impact come about? These are the changes that you're trying to make or that would logically result from your activities. So you really are starting to make a causal claim now. And at this point, I'll address Debbie's question head on. You can break down outcomes, particularly if you think you've got a question about attribution, particularly if you think your effects are longer term, you can break your outcomes down into intermediate outcomes. For example, changes in knowledge or changes in awareness or skills or access. And outcomes or uh, sort of down the line outcomes, which would be changes in behavior or conditional status. So for example, uh, an immediate outcome or an intermediate outcome of this webinar might be uh, changes in knowledge or awareness around logic models. A down the line outcome might then be a change in behavior in terms of the use of, the greater use of uh, logic models. And if the, in a sense, the intermediate outcomes that you set out, they're the ones where your causal claim is the strongest and where your sense of attribution is, is the greatest. So that's one way of addressing the, the challenge that Debbie raised. When you're defining your outcomes, because we're interested in change, the language of change is therefore really important. You should express your outcomes in terms of reductions or improvements or increases or better or worse. Um, and set the use of language, it sounds like a minor point, but actually will really help you make that distinction between outputs and outcomes, which I said earlier quite often trips people up. So using the right language will help you define things. A couple more things I wanted to say here. The first is obviously to engage with your population, to engage with your subgroup. In the, particularly in the core teams element of the program, we've really been encouraging people to engage with their population, to understand from their perspective what outcomes matter so that you get the voice of the population, the voice of the citizen, into the process of defining outcomes. And then the final thing I wanted to say, and we'll talk about it a little bit more when we come to talk about activities um, on the next slide, is, is to start thinking about what mechanism links your activities to your outcomes. So is it, is it a sort of change in awareness, a change in condition that links your activity through to outcomes? Is it a change in resources that you've given someone some new resource through the activity that will allow them to uh, realize the change in outcomes. What, what's the mechanism that links those two components of the, of the model? So again, working back, but at this point, you'll quite often find yourself working uh, backwards and forwards. What activities do you need to do to achieve the outcomes that you said you need to achieve? This should, should be really straightforward since this is the things that you will do. So for example, uh, setting up a social prescribing scheme or establishing a helpline, whatever it might be. As I said earlier, you'll be measuring your activities by outputs and through monitoring information. So for example, in the helpline case, the number of people calling the helpline would be, a, would be an output measure. This is generally really straightforward stuff to specify in a model, but one challenge is about the level of abstraction and the level of detail that you need to go to. 
the, the common mistake here is to treat the logic model as a program plan, and you, you don't need to do that. You just need to list out the main strands, the main clusters, the main elements of activity within your scheme. Another thing, and I'll come back to this later on in, the, in some of the subsequent slides, is about whether you think you need to show specific connections between specific activities and specific outcomes. I'll just register that for now and then, and then come back to it later, but that's one way you can push your logic model perhaps into more advanced territory. And then as I say, often at this stage, I've, I've recommended you work in a particular order. Often at this stage, I find myself working backwards and forwards between activities and outcomes and, and really starting to shape up and refine uh, the model. The next stage then, so you've done your rationale, the impacts, the outcomes and the activities. The next stage is, is inputs. This really should be fairly straightforward. This is, the, the definition is simple. It's about the resources you have to do, the things that you do. Typically it's measured in cash, but not always. And for, for some programs, you might have significant levels of in-kind inputs, so non-cash measured inputs. And these might be in-kind inputs, for example, if partners have assigned staff to your program, but you've not given them any cash in return, if, if they've seconded people in, for example. Also, if you have lots of volunteers and they're giving uh, free time or you're getting uh, free resources, free facilities to you, one useful thing often here is to start scaling those inputs. And I've done work particularly with voluntary sector organisations where it's been really helpful for them to, to, to almost see the ratio between cash and some of these in-kind or volunteer inputs because it shows their ability to, to bring different resources to bear uh, on problems. But that should be fairly straightforward. That's, that's the inputs uh, part of the model. And then the final bit that I wanted to uh, introduce to you in this template is the context. And quite often I think this has been missing from uh, historically from evaluations, although I think evaluators are getting vastly better at describing the environment within which programmes operate, partly in response to seeing programs that seem to work in one context then then failing in others or having radically different effects to what was first observed. The definition here I'm afraid is necessarily fuzzy. Um, it's, it's just the wider environment within which the intervention, the service, the program, policy, whatever operates. And these, the factors that you might want to consider might be economic, they might be social, they might be institutional, they might be cultural or regulatory. I suppose it's useful as a minimum just to show that you don't think your service operates in a vacuum and that they would work very differently in very different contexts. It's sometimes hard, I think, at this point, and often you find yourself making uh, judgments about what, what is materially important and what isn't. I suppose the basic question you face in trying to address that question as to whether something is or isn't materially important is what external factors do we face that might help us or that might hinder us in terms of implementing our activity and, and trying to achieve our aims. It's a slightly, um, slightly extreme example in, in some respects, but I remember doing an, an evaluation of a, uh, a programme run by a strategic health authority, um, and midway through the programme, the, the policy and regulatory environment changed and abolished uh, strategic health authorities, which of course affected their ability to uh, run their programme and achieve their aims. But, but having that eye on context enables you as an evaluator to, to be sensitive to it and to be attuned to the ways in which changes in context will affect uh, the programme itself. I'm going to move on now to talk about tips for assembling logic models, but I'm going to do what I've done at every point so far and just kind of pause and see whether there are any additional questions uh, coming through. Yep, so we've got a specific question from Grace. Um, so would an input also be building a partnership to deliver an activity or would this be an activity? Uh, <laughs> um, thank you, Grace. The, I mean, in a sense, assembling a partnership would, would be an activity. If that's something that you're doing that is material to achieving the outcomes that you're trying to achieve, then assembling a partnership um, definitely is an activity. Um, you're right, though, you can, in a sense, count it backwards because in the circumstance where partners are committing resources to your program or to your project, then they also are committing inputs uh, to it. So I think implicit in your question is that sort of sense of circularity between that particular activity and that particular input. I suppose the short answer is I think I think it's probably both in the, the way I've understood your question. So we've got another one just coming in from Katie as well, um, asking if there are any scenarios where you wouldn't use 
very few perhaps i mean you'd, you'd have to you'd have to convince me that you were in a situation where doing more upfront thinking doing more design thinking really kicking the tires really trying to help um, yourself and other people involved in the initiative to understand the theory underpinning it was not worth doing I'm, I'm pausing because I'm, I'm really trying to rack my brains for thinking where that would ever be true. I mean, you, you might get into a situation where you think it's not really worth the investment of a whole lot of time, I, but I can't imagine a situation where it's not worth investing some time. The, the question as to whether you would invest that time and put it into the production of a logic model, I'll just foreshadow some of what I'm going to say later in terms of complexity thinking. There might be some ways in which the logic model is not the right tool for doing it, but I suppose I would always advocate the upfront design thinking, almost whatever tool you, you then wind up using. That's all the questions for now. Excellent. Okay. Um, I'm going to push on at this point then and try to be, um, try to be a little bit more practical. I've, I've tried to impart some tips for assembling logic models in terms of giving you uh, definitions of the different components within the model and giving you some senses to uh, the order in which I would uh, go about completing it. I'll then, uh, I'll now just elaborate a couple of uh, a more practical uh, tips and more practical steps. The first step really is to, it's a basic point, but to, in order to assemble the logic model, you need to understand the thinking behind uh, the project or the scheme. So you need to understand the theory of change. The question you then face is, well, where is it? You know, who holds the theory? Who's defining this theory uh, out? In some cases, it might just be, although these are going out of fashion, aren't they? It might just be the individual expert. It might be the individual policymaker or the individual program designer. And really, they hold the thinking as to how they think this thing is going to work. Your task then is to go and consult uh, with them to understand their thinking. And that's probably the main source for your logic model in that circumstance. I would say, I think policy has taken a, a sort of turn into complexity as it's addressing more and more complex social problems. I think if that's true, I think it's then true that you, this is less and less the case that the individual expert holds the theory. More often than I think it's a much more collaborative endeavor. So you might then be interested in harnessing the wisdom of different stakeholders to the program, going to talk to them about their thinking that underpins uh, their, their understanding of the service, their thoughts about how it's supposed to work, their thoughts about what it's supposed to achieve. Very often in my experience at this point, you're starting to expose differences in thinking or differences in theory between different stakeholder groups. And again, I think that can be all to the good because it allows you to improve the design of what you're doing by flushing those differences out in theory before you get to them uh, in practice. You might also find the theory of change articulated in uh, official documents. So, you know, the NHS long-term plan, for example, is where I would go if I wanted to understand the official version of how integrated care systems were supposed to, are supposed to operate. You know, because, because the theory in a sense is often articulated in, in plans and policy documents and, and you get an official narration uh, that way. History and, and the, the existing literature is also a source of existing theory, partly because, as I said earlier, theories are often recycled and you could, you know, we could all think of the, I don't know, the league table theory in public policy, which is, you know, a, a sort of long-standing one, which has existed in many different policy areas, which will have been evaluated in different policy areas. So you, you can start looking into, uh, into the policy history and into the literature to get a sense as to what a theory might uh, might be. So you, you might actually in, in, it, in the end end up consulting multiple sources to understand the theory of change. Um, the questions that I provided earlier, which I'll just rehearse again very briefly, give you a useful way of getting into that theory, of starting to understand that theory. So, you know, what's the problem we're looking at? What are the impacts we're trying to achieve? What outcomes are we after? What activities will be done in order to achieve them? What resources do we need? These are useful questions to be equipped with when you're approaching those sources. They will help you to structure your thinking and help you in understanding your uh, logic model. They're also a really useful way of structuring workshops, which are, again, a very typical way of gathering together multiple different uh, stakeholder views 
And they're a really useful way of showing, as I said earlier, the sort of the sense of congruence or divergence in different people's uh, theories as they approach things. So, for example, if different stakeholder groups understand the problem in very, very different ways, or even apparently appear to be looking at different problems, that's a really, really useful thing to know uh, at the outset. So I, th I think those questions that I was saying are, are program design questions are actually also very, very useful ones uh, for assembling the logic model and for starting to approach understanding the theory of change. The only other thing I want, well, sorry, there's a couple of other things I wanted to say in terms of practical tips. The first is I think you should, you should approach the assembly of a logic model thinking about it as a craft. Um, there are definitely principles, there are definitely things that we've learned from previous efforts, there are definitely um, people who are better craftspeople than others at this, but it's not a science and it's definitely not an art. I think what you'll often find yourself in a position of, of doing is drafting something out, checking back with different people, then reshaping it, then refining it, then checking it, then refining it, and then at some point you feel satisfied enough that you've got you've got a good enough representation of the theory, a good enough model to proceed then into, you know, program design or uh, evaluation, whatever, whatever it might be. But I think you're dealing with a craft. Once you've got it, once you feel like you've uh, assembled it and you're sort of happy enough with it, it's often useful, particularly as a program designer, to take a step back and, and reflect on a couple of things. The first is the assumptions that populate your model, the things that must hold in order for your theory to cash out. These assumptions might be practical assumptions. So, you know, very, very often the reliance of, you know, on, on recruitment of particular staff or in the case of the question that we got earlier, um, that partners would play ball and they would, they would come and, and join in on the program. The assumptions might be evidential. So every logic model will have a causal claim within it that's connecting activity X to effect Y, okay, we could go back and check the existing evidence on that and get a sense as to how confident or otherwise we should be in that assumption. And again, assumptions might be contextual. So they might be assuming no significant change in funding or regulation or, you know, culture or, or whatever it might be. But it's really useful to reflect on your assumptions because they then can inform program planning. They might expose risks to be managed. They might show where you should focus your efforts as an evaluator. They might show where you need more evidence. So reflecting on assumptions is really helpful. It's also really helpful to, to reflect on kind of the overall theory of change. This is a, a very crude and very well-worn typology, but policies, public policies uh, typically rely on uh, three mechanisms, sticks, carrots, and sermons. They typically rely in terms of sticks on trying to beat or regulate uh, change into place. Carrots would be attempting to incentivize or ease the change that you want to see. And sermons that you're trying to eulogize, persuade, bring other people into your story. Uh, and and they really are the, I mean, it's crude, isn't it? But the three main mechanisms for, for change in public policy. Reflecting on the mix that you have can be useful though. So, do, you know, does the mix of, does the mix of these three, three things you have seem optimal given the task you're facing? Are you, are you being over stickish or over carrotish or over relying on sermons? You know, it can be useful to reflect on the overall shape of the, the theory of change once you've got it set out. Uh, in, the, in the sort of remaining time, I was going to push into uh, talking a little bit about the operation of logic models in uh, a, a non-linear or more, more complex territory. Um, there's no further questions no, in the chat box? One minute. Okay, so I'll, I'll just proceed into this and then, and then I'll pause at the end. Um, one, one classic common criticism of uh, logic models, it's one that I've made myself uh, multiple times, is that they are... Uh, linear, necessarily linear, and that very often the world um, doesn't feel linear and that very often we would look at a situation and we would think that sometimes it's not even apparent which way uh, the causal direction might run um, or, or how strong the causal claims could be in a, in a particularly complex environment. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about the implications of that. Um, it seems to me especially pertinent when we're thinking about population health management because PHM interventions would tend to operate uh, in what we would think of as uh, the zone of complexity. Here I've illustrated it through uh, a Stacey diagram. 
which just maps out the degree of uh, stakeholder agreement or the degree of agreement about whether or not something is the right thing to do on the vertical axis between high and low um, against the degree of certainty you can have over whether the action you're considering will achieve the outcomes that you desire, again, high to low. And you see on the diagram, in the circumstance where agreement is high and certainty is high, you're in what the Stacey diagram would refer to as a controlled environment. Everyone knows that this is the right thing to do and everyone knows that by doing it, we will uh, achieve the outcomes that we desire. And where agreement is low and certainty is low, you're in this chaotic environment. Um, you know, where, where you probably don't even know whether there even is a causal uh, relationship and you, you'll really struggle to get purchased uh, on different stakeholder views as to whether or not anything is the right thing uh, to do. My sense is that population health management typically operates in that middling zone, in, in the zone of complexity, where what you're looking at, because often you're dealing with things like the wider determinants of health or you're dealing with cross-sectoral action, is a set of problems that will defy known or simple solutions, where in order to do something, you need to go through a process of generating consensus, where because you're operating cross-organizationally, you need to think in systems, and you need, as I said, to act across uh, different institutional boundaries in order to achieve the aims that you desire. If that's true, you're often then in a situation where life feels a whole lot more like uh, the diagram on the right, um, than it does the, the than the situation the logic model would suggest. Whereas if we do X, then we'll get Y, and if we, do, if we get Y, then we'll get A and B and, and so forth. In those sorts of situations, if it does feel like you're in that sort of complex territory, my recommendation would be to start simple. So to start by mapping out the logic model in quite simple terms, and then start making it more complex or start breaking it to, to better reflect the reality of the situation that you find yourself in rather than wishing uh, life was more simple than it actually appears to be. So I'm going to work through a set of, set of examples that kind of just progressively illustrate uh, what breaking the classic linear structure of uh, the logic model might look like. And the first is um, to show, as I said earlier on, to start to show um, relationships between particular activities that you're planning on doing and particular outcomes that you want to achieve. And the example that I've got on the screen is one that um, uh, we produced uh, a few years ago for uh, the West Midlands Quality Review Service, who are uh, colleagues of ours. Um, and it, you can see the, the particular activities that they do, you can see the hypothesized relationships between those things and the particular outcomes that they're trying to achieve. And you can trace those particular causal claims through the arrows and, and follow the logic through. And it's just introduced a level of complexity that the very simple, you know, sort of box, box, box uh, logic model can't, can't illustrate. Nonetheless, I guess, I, you know, you could retain a criticism of this in that it suggests that causation runs uh, one way and that you might know those relationships uh, really quite straightforwardly. And, 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 and that might not always be the case. I think it was the case in this service, but it might not always be so. If it's not so, you might want to start thinking about uh, mapping out um, the system that you see yourself in and starting to map out some of the hypothesized relationships and wondering whether actually causation might run two ways or three ways and uh, it might loop back on itself. And here's an example of, a, uh, again, a sort of system map version of a logic model that we produced to look at the economics of uh, support to carers. And you can see that the model runs through at the top left hand corner from providing advice to carers and working with employers through to the different changes and the different outcomes you might expect to see. But you also see some loops within this, uh, within this model, within the suggestion that, that suggests there might be sort of virtuous cycles in this case. So for example, right in the heart of the model is an outcome that by the employer changing their practice and the carer fe feeling more supported, they're more able to cope and that their mental health would improve. And that the outcome below that would be the carer remaining in work, but that remaining in work might also loop back to improve their ability to cope and improve their mental health. So you start to see models in which you can represent a hypothesis where causation runs a couple of, a couple of ways. It's not just if X then Y. Here's another example from a piece of work that um, 
colleagues at the Stratus Unit have, have just done to look at um, the inpatient capacity needed in, uh, in mental health. This is a causal loop diagram where they were suggesting, where they were investigating the relationship uh, between different factors in terms of the consequences of having high uh, occupancy uh, in, in, in mental health facilities. I've, I've left it in there because it's another approach to looking at nonlinear relationships. It's also, in this case, an example where you can start to look at the nature of the relationships as well, where some things will have negative effects and some things would have positive effects. And you can start to represent it uh, through models like this. I've left you the URL in so you can look at the, uh, the full publication, but there's a really, is what, a neat piece of analysis, full stop, but a really neat use of... Uh, that's it. And then the final, the final one I wanted to uh, show you was um, well, internet. <laughs> the final model I wanted to uh, show you briefly was again more of a system map uh, type approach to logic modeling. This was um, from a piece of work I did uh, a number of years ago to look at moving um, uh, pathways for follow-up care uh, for survivors of cancer out of secondary care and into primary care. And because the interrelationships between the different components of the system were so complex between the interventions in secondary care, the interventions in primary care and in the voluntary sector were so complex, it seemed to me it was better to, to present it as a, as a system map and also to show interrelationships between different things. So by the time you've got here, we, you've completely broken the effects then why uh, structure of the basic logic. model. Okay, I mean, that really, that really is it in terms of the the material that we got to present. I've listed out a set of further resources or guidance that you might use, the first two of which are on our uh, Strategy Unit website. The first is I'm um, just searching for logic models in our, on, on our website and the search function. And the second is the evaluation and innovation microsite that we've put together, which has many of the tools that I've um, referred to um, in the webinar on it. There's then a brilliant resource, bettervaluation.org, uh, which has got you know, it's multiple different takes on multiple different stages of evaluation and the resources it has on theory of change and logic, logic models are really good. And then finally, the, um, the, uh, the Treasury Magenta book, um, which again, is, it's got some really, really good all round guidance. It's, it's structured very nicely, so you get a good basic intro and then it pushes into more complex material. Um, and then, of course, our, the, the microsite for the Population Health Management Programme itself has got, we'll have this webinar, we'll have other the materials on. Um, I'm going to pause again just to see whether there are any uh, final questions. We've got, we've got a couple of minutes left in the, in the webinar. Yes, we've got one more from Debbie. Um, this says, when using for evaluation, where do you focus your measurement? Uh, outputs, outcomes, or impacts, or or. Um, yeah, another good, another good question. I think, so one, one mistake I've commonly seen, particularly in the NHS, is to focus measures almost exclusively on impacts, um, often because that's where standard data sources will, um, at least on the face of it, allow you to say something. Um, and I think that, you know, that's been a sort of typical mistake because you don't get a sense really of the sort of causal pathway that you're going through and you wouldn't get a sense of those intermediates effects building towards impacts. Because of the way that we've defined impacts in this, we're saying you're contributing towards change in it rather than causing it. So I would include them, I would, I would look at them, I would want to know what was happening with them, and yet I wouldn't be using impact measures to judge um, the value of the intervention, which I suppose is the classic task of evaluators. So I would be focusing my efforts on outcomes and I would be focusing my efforts on the relationship between activities and outcomes. So do, do the things where doing, well, how are they going? First of all, classic implementation question. Do those things seem to be resulting in the outcomes that we're after? So I'll be focusing measurement efforts on, on that relationship. I also think, particularly if you're in charge of managing or overseeing programs, you know, sort of good monitoring information, good measurement of outputs, you know, numbers of people accessing services, that kind of thing. Again, perhaps because it's so basic, very often overlooked. Uh, set of measures and can really tell you some useful stuff even as even as an evaluator you know take up by particular groups or lack of take up or high take up does allow you I think to start forming some evaluative judgments uh, as well long way round of just saying the word all <laughs> brilliant so we've got 
If anyone's got any other last minute questions just before we close, do put them in the chat box now. Or, or if not, <laughs> yeah, here we, we've got the, um, we've, there's my phone number and email uh, uh, address there. And, and then of course the, the stress unit website address, which has got a whole series of uh, resources on. Um, but I think that's that with, with sort of two minutes to go. Um, yeah, not okay. <laughs> I, think, I think we've run it through. Um, well, I, I hope that was useful. I think we've got,